uh, in the Middle East? Saudi Arabia is a very important country, both for its resources, but also for its position as the center of the center of the Islamic world in so many ways. They are going through major changes right now. Muhammad bin Salman, the future king, but the practic guy who controls it, is making huge reforms uh, that we'll have to see where will they lead him to. I think that the Saudis hopefully still in time recognize what they have done. Because look what they have done. They had huge amount of money as a result of the oil that they had. They used that money to secure internal security and to support other organizations in different places in the world. The, all of the price all went down. They cannot buy security inside. And those that they sent outside started to come back. So the House of Seoul got it on time that it might have endangered himself, basically. So all those reform that he's trying to make is to change the Saudis themselves. Um, for example, women can drive, which is, you know, think of it, <laughs> what an achievement, right? Uh, but it's a very important country. It has a leadership position. It's in a unique strategic state position between Africa and deep Asia and I think they can positively influence the area. If you would put here the Saudi chief of staff to speak with you and tell him what are the interests of Saudi Arabia, you would hear the same speech I gave him now about radicalism, about the threat for Saudis and that type of stuff. So I hope we can cooperate with them in the future. As long as you're speaking of Saudi Arabia, um, how can you combat, how can Saudi Arabia change if the education is still Wahhabism and Salafism? That's why I'm saying, you're right. So for them it's a major reform they need to, they need to go through. And it may influence Saudi from the inside, but I think he understands that if he doesn't change the concept of the way Saudi was saving the last 70 years, it will not hold up for the next 70 years. So they'll, they'll have to do changes. And Iran? And? Iran? Iran is a very interesting story. They have a very extreme regime. Um, based itself on internal violence, besiege, and revolutionary guard and trying to promote his interest outside, presumably for ideological reason, okay, uh, or to secure his interest, some of them are economical outside. So the upper layer is very negative, and they will do everything in their capacity to achieve, for example, nuclear this, that was the reason why they were seeking nuclear capabilities um, above any other things. But in Iran, there is also the Persian communities. And I think that it's a very colorful and rich and westernized, oriented society. 30% uh, of them are young, so less than 30. So I think the, change, the chance of changes from inside are somewhat bigger than the chances of risking it outside. However, though I'm optimistic in the long run, I think we should continue to follow what Iran is doing. Uh, you know, I'm always saying, I've been asked about the nuclear agreement so many times because I was the chief at the time and I thought that the Americans could have got by far better deal but I'm always saying it's not a question of a good deal or a bad deal, it's a done deal yeah. and 
uh, I think what's important now is to make sure to increase intelligence cooperation, to increase international cooperation, and to really make sure that Iran does nothing that takes her to this direction and prepare whatever needs to be prepared in the case they are not doing it from, from economical sanctions, from political sanctions, and if military actions need to be taken, to be, to be done, then this is definitely an option as well. General, uh, as you said, the, uh, the, the effectiveness of the Israeli military is striking, right? Uh, uh, but, but it seems that on the public relations front, we are always being confronted with misinformation and everything that is wrong about what Israel is doing, in spite of everything right that Israel is doing. So how can we help in the diaspora, or what is Israel doing and how can we help? in the diaspora to, to uh, mitigate the misinformation. Yeah. This is definitely an arena we need some help. But first, let's be honest with ourselves. We are not always right. In most cases we are. But sometimes, you know, we do mistakes. So, first of all, we have to be very serious with ourselves, checking how is it that we are operating, what is it that we are doing, is it effective, is it not, etc. I give us a very high remark. More than that I can share with you, and I gave this detail to one of the journalists that spoke to me the last two days, I don't know if she published it, I doubt. Uh, after Protective Edge, a delegation of 25 generals and diplomats came to visit Israel after the war, and they came to see how we acted. And they came with the conclusion and they told me, you have set a moral standard that militaries cannot follow. So, yes, we do have a dilemma of we need to protect our country. We do our best not to harm innocent people. But since our enemies are operating in all arenas from civilian areas, unfortunately, we do see civilians getting help. Secondly, there is a political debate that we need to be aware of. Uh, and mainly it's around the West Bank, or what I would prefer to call Judea and Samaria. Uh, but we have to stand and, and explain it. It's, it's a political dis discussion, it's not something else. I'll share with you a story. My wife and myself came back one Saturday morning from a morning from a weekend job. We like to job together. And I look at the car and it was a disaster. Very dirty. She didn't wash her car for I don't know how long. <laughs> so I told the Rebbe, I'm gonna take your car to wash it in Farakasim. It's an Arab village near to our place. And I'm the chief of staff. And I'm wearing shorts, hat, sunglasses, no one knows who I am. I'm going to wash my wife's car. At the gas station, the guy who pumped the benzene uh, didn't recognize me. But then a guy with a motorcycle came and he saw me and he saluted. At that moment, the guy, the Arab guy, realized who I was. So he comes back with a cup of coffee. He says, no, 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 I want it in the car wash. By the time I got to the car wash, he called all his family. And we were all sitting having a political discussion while the car is being washed. <laughs> Luckily enough, it's a small car, it didn't take much time. <laughs> but, I asked them, honestly tell me, and now I'm talking with Arab, authentic discussion, no media around, nobody's doing impression on anyone, very candid discussion. I told them, if you are not a Saudi who sneezes into a hundred dollar bill, where would be the best place in the Middle East to be in Arab? They all said Israel. And then I asked him, where is the second best place? And they said the West Bank. Because you have hospitals, because you have universities, because you have education, you have infrastructure. The town of Rawabi in the West Bank is the only Arab town being built in the Middle East. Assad is destroying the cities and we are helping them building a Palestinian state, a Palestinian city. 
So the question is, how do we set the story? One segment is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They have to do Hasbara. And this is their mission, or other offices, because you have some internal political issues, who's doing what, but that's not the main issue. Israel needs to do official Hasbara. It's important, but that's perceived as propaganda in most cases. So I think it's very important to initiate initiatives, mainly through new media, mainly in the universities, where you have the young people involved and engage with them with simple and direct engagement. And make them know Israel as it is. And when we are doing something wrong, don't hide. We may do something wrong. But in most cases, we do good things. I show you the hospital. But more than that, punch wineries and find out that Israel is not only about wars. 300 excellent wineries. Punch technology. No one can use his phone if we are not here. Try to get to a place you've never been to. You cannot do it with Israel. You can ban Israel, stop live your life, because we are involved in everything. So I think that what you can do is really practice your partnership. Be proud of what we are, our partner. Be criticized to us when you feel like it, but also be our ambassador and tell the true story in the right place and don't, and don't give up on this. And use new media and those kind of things as, as, much, as much as possible. Sir? Yes, I would like uh, to hear uh, what do you think about the involvement of Russia now in the Middle East and the relation with Israel? First, I think that Russia is seeking its own interests. And its own interests are bound to, I think, mainly three. Uh, they want to hold the Tartus and Atakia as a naval post in the eastern side of the Mediterranean. They have no other post in the Mediterranean. I think they want to be present in any place the American armed presence. And they see the opportunity in Syria. Now they don't want to pay the price of being there, so they are using the Syrian themselves and the Iranians to maintain the area for them in many ways. So I think it's a combination of strategic and economical considerations that drives them. And we see now in Israel the superpowers are playing around us. It's between the Russians and the Americans, and the Chinese are looking mainly for business reasons because, you know, every war eventually ends. And when the war ends, the economy starts to work, and they want to be there on the right time. That's my perspective. Do you think there is any change in the motivation and Zionism of the young Israelis? This is a very important question. Uh, I think that the young ones in Israel are as Zionist as we were. I think they are better than, more than we were. It's a better generation. First of all, it's my kids. What would I say, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know what Israelis don't like to be? Friars. You know what fire means? You all know what fire means, right? So our problem now in Israel, that those who serve, those who do, those who carry everything upon themselves, start to think like they are firing. And this is very dangerous. Now, we talk about the IDF a lot. I will shock you a little bit now. Because I will tell you that only about 51 to 52 percent of the youngest one come to serve. Because if you take out the Arabs, and if you take out the ultra-Orthodox, then my son is serving. So I think we need to do major changes in Israel, major changes, that will 
in strengthening the Israeli society, mainly in terms of unity, not uniformity, but unity, because Arabs will stay Arabs, and ultra-Orthodox will stay ultra-Orthodox, and secular will stay secular. And by the way, I'm, I'm in favor of that. I'm less favor, and I know it's a bit sensitive here in Mexico between Ashkenazi and Sephardi, I don't care about it, but I don't know. This is not important for us. But if he wants to stay out of Orthodox, stay out of Orthodox. It's fine with me. I have a few cousins. My, I, had, my, I had only one living grandmother. And uh, she had two sisters that came to Israel. Uh, so my mother, she was ultra Orthodox, but her son was very Zionist, that's my father. One sister went to Bnei Brak. They became Zionist Orthodox. The other sister went to Mashari. They are ultra orthodox. They are marked. They see me as their enemy sometimes. <laughs> but we must create something different. We must. The, the new Zionism is how you make in the modern area. How can you agree on a framework and keep the parts within the framework? I think that the Declaration of Independence, that's the phenomena document that we can all ally with because it, everybody is there. Haredim is there, Aravim is there, Jews are there, everybody is there. And it was written by, in a, by far more challenging times. Think of it. Israel was attacked by seven militaries and it was less than one year old and they wrote this declaration calling the Arabs, calling for peace, not terrifying from anything. Uh, so I think we need to do reforms in our education, in our working plans, in the service of the country. I think everybody should serve so everybody will care about the country. But that's a huge issue. And I think this is, if you ask me, I was sitting uh, two years ago in a private meeting with uh, a former MI6 chief, MI6 it's the British Secret Service, and uh, two guys from the United Nations, former guys from the United Nations. And we had dinner in London, and you know, I pitched them. So what do I pitch them? Iran is very bad, very bad, very bad. Half the evening I spent about Iran. Hmm. And then the Syrian, you know, military talks. And then he said, but General, I really understand, but from everything you told us, what do you think is the biggest challenge for Israel? And I said, Israel. <laughs> and I, I think we are the biggest challenge of ourselves. Sir, about Erdogan, Turkey. How do we? Is he a threat? Is he a bluff? Is he a threat or a bluff? It's definitely a challenge. Uh, he was lucky due to technology. You know, Mubarak lost his regime because of technology, and Erdogan gained his regime because of the same technology of uh, FaceTime and Facebook. Uh, Turkey is a very important country, uh, in its strategic position. And it's always bounding between being part of Europe or not being part of Europe, being part of NATO, or not being part of NATO. And he has this Ottoman ambitions, I would say. Uh, I think that down the road he may impact our region. I think his biggest threat is Iran. And I think he will confront them before he will confront us. But we need to follow this and make sure you know, what he's doing. Now, you have to remember, just like I spoke about the Iranians, regime versus society, which is two different approaches, if you ask me. I think the same stands to Turkey, because the biggest number of flights that leave Israel on a daily basis goes to Turkey. And the business between Israeli businessmen and, and Turkey, Turkish businessmen is, I won't say flourishing, but they are moving on and things are pretty much okay. So it's a diplomatic, strategic conflict that we have with him. I'll hope that he'll gain some more logic to his activity, but 
we need to watch what he's doing over there. <coughs> okay, so thank you very much. Tell those guys they didn't come that they missed. <laughs> thank you very much.